I ask the court that the full extent of the law be brought down upon you, including penalty of death. And the chief scientist? Secured. The cloning technology is now firmly under Imperial control. Very good, Admiral. You may fire when ready. So Tarkin had his private thoughts about the Emperor as well. That he and Vader were kindred spirits suggested that both of them might be Sith. We stand here amidst my achievement, not yours! What's up, Meta Nerds? In part one, we learn the origins of the Tarkin family, escaping poverty in the lower levels of Coruscant to the wild frontiers of the Outer Rim, carving out a pocket of order and prosperity over many generations, developing a ruthless mentality that was instilled in young Willow from childhood. He would rise through his local defense forces to be a star in the Republic Academy, hero of the Clone Wars, always fighting against the ridiculous restrictions of the Jedi Generals. This video is sponsored by Audible, and you'll see a ton of references to these two great audiobooks throughout this series, Catalyst and Tarkin. This is the best time to sign up for Audible, as they're running a holiday promotion, 60% off your first three months, which is only $5.95 a month, and you will hear that the quality is incredible for their thousands of titles. Each month you get a credit that can get you any audiobook you want, and these credits roll over if you don't use them, while anything that you pick is yours to keep forever. If you didn't know, this is really the home of some of the greatest Star Wars content in years. And there's always something new, like the latest Thrawn book, Lesser Evil, which just dropped last week. The features that I love are things like Whisper Sync, if you want to read along with the audio, and both on PC and mobile, it's really easy to bookmark or take notes. And there's things like a sleep timer so you don't get too far ahead, and the streamlined driving version, with a button that makes it really easy to skip backwards, just in case you got distracted or want to hear something again. And whether it's Star Wars, the Halo or Mass Effect books, sci-fi classics like Dune or Foundation, and so many non-fiction books too, I'm sure you will love Audible. So take advantage of that 60% off your first three months, just $5.95 a month. Check the link below, audible.com slash metanerds, or text metanerds to 500-500. Let's get back to Tarkin. We are in the year 19 BBY, just weeks before the end of the Clone Wars, and the Jedi Temple had just been bombed. Destruction at this hallowed temple had not been experienced since the time of the Sith Empire. Skywalker had been able to track down the culprit, and there was a sigh of relief when it appeared that all involved were either dead or in custody. This is a Jedi matter, isn't it? Clones were killed, which makes this terrorist attack a military matter. Tarkin is right. Leta isn't a Jedi. It's not for us to be judge and jury over a citizen of the Republic. And never to mince words, Tarkin cut to the point and explained that the Jedi would be out of the war room before long. The Chancellor feels very strongly that the Jedi be removed from as many military matters as possible. You yourselves said that you're peacekeepers, not soldiers. Later that day, Tarkin would have to interrupt a Jedi strategy conference to tell the Council that the bomber said she wanted to speak with Ahsoka Tano. Commander Tano, your presence is requested by prisoner Letta Tumon. When the Padawan went to speak with her, it was only minutes before the only surviving witness was force choked to death. All of it caught on Holocam. The Coruscant Guard rushed in to detain her and reported all to Admiral Tarkin. I went in the room to talk to Letta and she said she was afraid of a Jedi. Seems the Jedi she was afraid of was you. He was growing thoroughly tired of dealing with this inept cult. The evidence was obvious, and he would see to it that she was executed for treason. Hopefully this annoying girl, a symbol of the ridiculous state of the Jedi Order, could be used as a wedge to finally drive the parasites off of the Republic military structure. Tarkin would be stunned to hear that she escaped, further incriminating herself, as Commander Thorne and even her friends Captain Rex and General Skywalker saw firsthand the guards that had been slashed through by a Jedi blade. I do not believe that Ahsoka could have fallen so far. The beliefs of the Jedi Council are irrelevant. We deal strictly in facts and evidence. After a lengthy manhunt, they do eventually track her down to the bowels of Coruscant, where they observe her with known Separatist general and Sith assassin, Ventress. And when they capture her, she's in a warehouse containing the nanodroids used in the temple bombing. He knows that normally the fate of the Jedi was solely determined by the Jedi, but precedents had to be broken in these unprecedented times. He also studied their complex laws and codes, and knew that Jedi had been expelled before. Ah yes, Jedi tradition. I'm afraid, Master Yoda, that the Senate believes that an internal Jedi trial would seem biased. Therefore, the Senate asks that the Council expel Ahsoka Tano from the Jedi Order. Though Mace can see that this was a show of power, to remove the Jedi as equal and independent, and place them under the commands of the Republic military. 
Kenobi thinks it is obvious that they will not throw Ahsoka to the military, but everybody else in the room thinks that the evidence is too overwhelming. Even Mace knows that as much as he wanted to save face, they must go through with their internal trial, and without any evidence to prove her innocent, they do expel and deliver her to the Coruscant Guard. Like Tarkin had told Skywalker numerous times, the Jedi morality was the hole in their armor. Tarkin knew that to give up one of your own to appease someone else made you weak, and this weakness would drive some members of the Order mad, stuck in this untenable position as warrior monks. It was just perfect that the one who would be hurt the most, the ones whose faith in the Order would be shaken the most, would be the only cunning Jedi he ever met, Ahsoka's master. I shall prove that you were the mastermind behind the attack on the Jedi Temple. I ask the court that the full extent of the law be brought down upon you, including penalty of death. The only problem was that Skywalker cared a lot more for Ahsoka than he did the opinion of the Jedi Order. He would hunt down Ventress and use some unique interrogation techniques to extract the truth. That the Padawan was being framed, and with her account he tracked down the true conspirator, Barriss Afi. With her capture and admission, Tarkin was robbed of this seemingly airtight case. But though he lost, his blow to the Jedi Order was delivered as he was surprised and delighted to hear that the rude alien girl was smarter than she looked, that she had seen through the lies of the Jedi and walked away. Devastating Skywalker. Perhaps he would be the next one to leave this ridiculous cult. Just a few months later, Admiral Tarkin would be one of the several admirals scrambling to keep up with the Separatist Outer Rim sieges. A blitzkrieg of attacks that were rolling over entire sectors with astounding speed and efficiency, only to then be shocked with a surprise invasion of Coruscant. The streams of intel were like an orbital bombardment to his famous calm and cool leadership, his mind racing as reports claimed that Dooku and Grievous were personally leading this attack on the capital of the galaxy. They were really trying to end this war within a few hours. He knew that an ugly secret was that the Coruscant home defense fleet was often neglected. They had never been tested in actual combat, and all within the military knew that as the war dragged on, assets from the home defense were siphoned off to strengthen the systems most at need. Then came the devastating news that his friend and greatest political ally, the Supreme Chancellor himself, was captured by the Separatists. Sheer madness that was somehow resolved just as quickly as it had developed. That cunning Jedi Skywalker personally rescuing their mutual friend. And the fleets that scrambled back home driving off the CIS's largest planetary invasion fleet ever seen. Grievous was on the run, and the leader of the entire Separatist movement, Count Dooku, was killed. Their old conversation echoed in his mind. The Count tirelessly trying to pull Ariadu out of the Senate, and Tarkin's own overconfident words. I'm simply trying to keep you from finding yourself on the losing side. Tarkin studied him. Will there actually be a losing side for men like you and me? If not true for Dooku, it was only because he failed to see the power of Sheev Palpatine. Grievous was dead, and an assassin had killed much of the Separatist leadership meeting on Mustafar. A shutdown order was sent through the Separatist fleets, and none of that was the shocking part. Though he hated the order, he was surprised to hear of their attempted coup in the final hours of the war, Mace Windu personally leading the charge into the Chancellor's office. Most assumed that the Senate Guard and clone troopers present must have been the ones to save their beloved leader, who immediately used his emergency powers to make himself Emperor. To the cheering applause of the Coruscanti, shell-shocked by the CIS invasion and believing the Jedi were playing the galaxy all along, the secret source of the clones, with a supposedly fallen Jedi leading the Separatists. But Tarkin, and many others that dared to look into the events of that night, were unsatisfied with the official account. The Admiral wondered if anyone else had put it all together. The meek Naboo man had survived the attack by four Jedi Masters, and then instructed the clone army to kill each and every Jedi across the galaxy on charges of treason against the Republic. He understood this cult was a useless, vestigial organ left over from ancient times, but Palpatine's ruthless complete removal of the Jedi was astounding, though it gave him a clue to the true nature of his old pal. And so Tarkin had his private thoughts about the Emperor as well. That he and Vader were kindred spirits suggested that both of them might be Sith. Tarkin often wondered if that wasn't the actual reason Palpatine had been targeted for arrest or assassination by the Jedi. It wasn't so much that the Order wished to take charge of the Republic, it was that the Jedi couldn't abide the idea of a member of the ancient Order they opposed and abhorred emerging as the hero of the Clone Wars and assuming the mantle of Emperor. There was also the issue of the sudden appearance of one Darth Vader. The body of Anakin Skywalker was never recovered, and he supposedly died trying to defend the Jedi Temple. 
Anakin's forces, the 501st, led the attack. Skywalker was the only Jedi he ever met that strayed from the Jedi mindset and was a close friend of Palpatine. And now a previously unknown powerful force wielder comes out of nowhere and is Emperor Palpatine's right hand man. He would later learn that Vader was once a Jedi. It was all clear to Tarkin that this empire was led by a Sith. That ancient order that understood power. And they certainly had the tools and weapons to enforce order over every sector of the galaxy. He would be made head of the eponymous Tarkin Initiative, the lead project successor to the Republic's Special Weapons Group, and would continue the development of the mobile space station known as the Death Star. All Tarkin Initiative projects would take place in secret hive base facilities or remote uninhabited worlds. He was often paired with the Imperial Security Bureau and gained a new Imperial title, Moth. The Senate would stick around for the next 19 years, but with each year their actual power diminished. Moff Tarkin of the Greater Seswana Sector could override the request of any senator from their sector. And of course, the Emperor had complete veto power and executive power. In addition to the weapons programs, Tarkin would oversee most of the Emperor's secret initiatives. The next two decades would see him trying to tie up loose ends around the galaxy, but the first would be a potential threat from outside the galaxy. The Moff would land on the rain-soaked capital of Kamino, the stilt city of Taipoka, departing from his new class shuttle with a contingent of Coruscant guards. Tarkin's meeting with Lama Su was blunt and direct, explaining that effective immediately, the Kaminoans' contracts were cancelled, and he would be the one to evaluate any possible use for the cloners. Your contracts were with the Republic, which no longer exists. Clone troopers will be needed to maintain order throughout the galaxy. Indeed. A service conscription soldiers could provide at half the cost. The skill level and efficiency of our clones is far superior to that of any recruited body. I shall be the judge of that, Prime Minister. The test would put Bad Batch through a combat proficiency challenge, but this is all theater at this point. The option of an independent people retaining the knowledge and ability to produce an army was out of question, and if anyone knew how evasive these Kaminoans could be, it was Darth Sidious. Tarkin wished to show the superiority of one of the new Imperial secret droid programs, a unit that would eventually lead to the DT series and Dark Trooper project. Years later, a Dark Trooper iteration would be cyborgs, not droids, putting the hardened warrior minds of Clone Wars commanders to good use in a new robotic body. The ultimate insulting ending to these men who prided themselves on killing clankers for the Republic. The hope was that he could make his point by killing these supposedly elite clones. Tarkin, annoyed at this surprising performance, turns on his heel and departs in silence, and he was curious to hear about the possibility of modified elite troopers for specialized roles. Reports indicate they exhibit a concerning level of disobedience and disregard for orders. A side effect of their mutation. Yet one that has never hindered the completion of their missions. Then they executed Order 66? Palpatine's orders were to secure key Kaminoan scientists for another one of his more secretive projects. But first and foremost for Tarkin was to see if loyalty remained as they started getting into super soldier territory. We have tracked a group of insurgents to the Onderon sector. They must be dealt with. A real world test for Clone Force 99 would also tie up another Clone Wars loose end, to eliminate Saw Gerrera and his band of freedom fighters turned enemy of the state. He was sure to have an Imperial probe droid monitor them, and it saw Crosshair was the only one willing to obey their orders. What Hunter and his brother saw as innocent civilians, many children, Tarkin understood to be agents of chaos. As soon as Bad Batch returned to their homeworld, they would be immediately arrested. I assume you know the punishment for treason? And while the clones were arguing, Tarkin was on his way to salvage the only loyal member of this experimental group. Crosshair was willing to kill a group of rebels, and Tarkin wanted to see if the cloner's technology could save this talented unit from termination. Can you intensify the program? Yes. Then proceed. Hours later, the rest of the defective and traitorous units would try to make their escape, and Tarkin figured this was the perfect test of his sniper's loyalty. The armor that Crosshair is sporting is the first instance of what would become the Death Troopers, one of the top military units that would be seen protecting Imperial VIPs. While the Bad Batch would escape, Tarkin had faith in their ability to track down traitors, and wanted to meet with Vice Admiral Rampart who was just starting to implement Chain Codes, the ingenious system that combined genetic and property databases with a blockchain to one day be able to track the movements of everyone and everything across the galaxy. But Rampart was also tasked with creating a new Imperial Force. What is the status of Project War Mantle? On schedule, sir. Our top recruits are here to begin their training. 
walking them over to a group of more soldiers in proto-Death Trooper armor, explaining that they could have the very best of the recruited soldiers from across the galaxy. Many militia veterans have fought in the Clone Wars and have been trained by the best of the clones. Nalase realizes that these are the first steps away from Kamino being central to the Empire, and later Lama Su would share his doubts that a recruit force could ever rival one shaped from birth. Instead of debating, the Moth wanted evidence. A tangible test is in order. We need to see them in action. By all means. Send the clone and your recruits to Onderon. The team would blast their way through Saw Gerrera's forces, though the terrorist leader did escape. When the civilians refused to give up any intel, Crosshair shot one in the chest, and when one of the conscripted troops said that they couldn't slaughter these people, he was shot down too. Crosshair was able to get the troops to follow orders, something that proved the efficacy of Project War Mantle. The clone trooper program is a cost-prohibitive relic of the past. Our forces will be unlike anything the galaxy has seen. Then I leave this project in your capable hands, Admiral. Thank you, sir. Rampart would organize the withdrawal of all valuable assets, including ships, vehicles, weapons, and troopers, while the cloners tried to keep the younger units calm during this upheaval. Your training will continue elsewhere. One of those places where clones were taken to was a hidden mountain complex where clone commandos were seen training new TK troops, soon to be known throughout the galaxy as Stormtroopers. Before he gives the order, Tarkin confirms that the top cloners and technology were now in Imperial hands, crucial to the most top secret project the Emperor would ever undertake. All essential personnel have been removed from Kamino. And the chief scientist? Secured. The cloning technology is now firmly under Imperial control. Very good, Admiral. You may fire when ready. With this order, Tarkin had tied up one of the most obvious loose ends from the times of the chaotic and ineffective Republic. These secret allies of the Jedi were destroyed, and the means of clone production was now in the hands of the Central Authority. Around this same time, Krennic had finally been able to get Galen Erso to join something called Project Celestial Power. The Emperor was personally requesting that he come aboard, pleading that in this time of rebuilding a war-torn galaxy, the genius could use any and all assets he wished to crack the secret of drawing energy from the Kyber Crystal. In fact, without the Jedi Order holding back that process, Erso would have access to things researchers could previously only dream of. The Empire has unrestricted access to worlds that for centuries were accessible only to the Order. Not just these small samples, but enormous crystals. Boulder sized, I'm told. Even larger. Sometime after this, Tarkin would be summoned to personally report on the progress of the Death Star to the Emperor and his top aide, Grand Vizier Masamita. And it appears that he may have been about to talk about Galen Erso's involvement when Darth Vader burst into the room force pushing the royal guards into the transparasteel so hard that it cracked and left them unconscious. Battle-torn, the mysterious Sith Lord approached the Emperor, and Tarkin was shocked to hear the old man calmly asked to be left alone. And days later, Tarkin may have died at the mechanical hand of this being, if it had not been for the protection of the Emperor. Being a mysterious newcomer, Vader had survived two attacks on his life, knowing it came from officers hoping to take his position at the side of the Emperor. To strike fear into the core, he would select five of these officers at random, and force choke them while their comrades tried to stay composed. It is after this incident that we would see Tarkin traveling aboard a Venator, repainted into the Imperial Grey, to personally show the Emperor and this dangerous Vader the progress of the Death Star Battle Station. And while Krennic would be left to head the project, and continue to coerce Urso, Moff Tarkin would be tasked to put his military expertise to good use in snuffing out the first embers of dissent in this new empire. The flame of rebellion was raging on the water world of Mon Cala. This world, home to grotesque alien species that had been allies of the Jedi and anti-war movements, would be the perfect people to make an example of. In 18 BBY, he would lead the assault via an Imperial One-class Star Destroyer, the Sovereign while Vader was tasked with finding and eliminating Order 66 survivors, which were said to be aiding Clone Wars hero King Leechar. Major Rantu was charged with preparing the stormtroopers in simulations for aquatic combat, while Commander Jordo proposed the idea of spreading propaganda to drive a wedge into the historic rift between the Mon Calamari and Quarren, who were even recently enemies in the Clone Wars, and had always had sporadic fighting since their first contact with each other eons ago. After the briefing, Tarkin was informed that a Zeta-class shuttle was descending towards the planet, and he knew this must be the Sith and the Inquisitorius. On World, Ambassador Telvar was meeting with the King to discuss a peaceful transition from independence into the Imperial Fold. 
but right after Vader's forces emerged, the Ambassador's shuttle explodes. Tarkin is unsure what caused this, but it would rush the invasion forces to initiate the Battle of Dak City. The sky was filled with TIE fighters and modified LAAT carriers with the new Imperial troop transports, securing the landing zones for walkers like the AT-AT and AT-DP. Leechar's top military advisors were Akbar and Radis, and they planned the counterattack and evacuation of the above water population, while the king contacts Tarkin. The Moff uses the death of the ambassador as evidence that either the king has ordered the attack on the Empire, or he has no control over his population. Either required the Empire to take control and impose order. While Vader confronted Leechar, Tarkin witnessed the natives use wildlife to cause a tsunami that completely destroyed all of their above water cities. While the officers were in shock, Tarkin expected this move, explaining that this made it more difficult for the invaders to have a staging area, while only giving up what equated to outposts. Their true civilization was a thousand times larger than these lost ports, and all safely underwater. Tarkin is furious with his ISB agent, who supposedly had a complete profile on the technological wonders of these people, ranging from the galaxy-leading shield generators and energy systems, but their mastery of sea life was not fully understood by the Empire. The next stage of the battle would see Admiral Raddus organizing all of the Calamari Reef ships at the Southern Pole. These structures essentially being massive city-sized ships, while Commander Akbar would lead the attack on the Empire's floating staging platform. Leading from the front, an understanding of his craft and Imperial defense systems, he had them unload their complete missile payload at once, proving to be too many objects for the autocannons to intercept, turning this crucial asset into a ball of flames that came crashing into the seas. But the propaganda had not worked to divide all of the Quarren, and they were able to find and rescue the king from the brink of death. Back on the Sovereign, Tarkin is impressed when he hears the explanation of Akbar's strategy, using solid projectile weapons, knowing the shields were most effective against energy weapons like turbolasers. He was equally unimpressed with his ISB agent, who somehow failed to provide intel on this weapon as well. And for this, Tarkin orders the agent to be put into standard trooper armor and sent to the front lines. Well, he resolved to escalate this conflict. With this surge, the Empire was winning every battle, but at a great cost, as they were drawn to fight in the watery corridors in confusing enemy territory, or chase aquatic species through kelp forests and pitch-black ocean canyons. And he thought Radis's strategy was brilliant, huddling together and linking the massive merchant ships that had shielding for space travel and pirates, and combined, these shields were now impenetrable by the underwater craft of the Imperial Arsenal. Tarkin knew they were entrenched for far longer than the Emperor wished, and thus he hoped to employ some strategic negotiation tactics on Vader, asking the Sith Lord to go after King Leechar and leave his Inquisitors to finish off the Jedi that was still eluding them. Vader was quick to point out that Tarkin could not give him orders, but agreed with the Moff's reasoning, Tarkin saying that if he could help him with this, he would be in the Dark Lord's debt. The fight through the King's guards would be effortless, and once disarmed, Tarkin was hailed with the good news. He hoped that by forcing the king to watch his planet suffer from orbital bombardment, he would see that resistance was futile and call for a surrender. Leechar resisted, and this was all interrupted by the Jedi attacking Vader. After Order 66, Farron Barr had been corrupted, and used evil tactics to grow a small cult of followers, finding anything as permissible that would help bring down the Empire. In the duel, the Jedi revealed that he was behind the destruction of the Ambassador's craft and that he hoped to manipulate Lee Char into conflict with the Empire in order to spark a galactic rebellion. Though corrupted, Barr was seeing something through the Force, a vision that the Mon Calamari people and technology would play a central role in the eventual destruction of the Empire. He even saw into their future role in the New Republic and First Order conflict. When Lee Char heard this confession, he sprung up to contact his forces and order a ceasefire, followed by a call to Tarkin to explain the truth. Tarkin agreed to end the fighting, but still bombarded several locations, adamant that Radis's fleet could not escape. But Radis was crazy enough to try it. He ordered them to fully engage their engines and push past the blockade and was able to escape through hyperspace. Though two cruisers were lost, three did escape. Tarkin's reaction was a calm confidence that this small force would be extinguished soon enough, though over the years these three sparks would help grow an inferno of rebellion becoming the technological spine of that chaotic beast known as the Rebel Alliance that threatened Tarkin's life work to establish galactic order. From here, Tarkin would be tasked to make an example out of Antar IV, a world that started off allied to the Republic, but quickly turned Separatist. It did retain a powerful minority of Republic support that was covertly aided by Republic intelligence forces, planning and supplying materials for terrorist attacks on world. 
But the Republic could never flip the planet, and because it was a powerful Separatist stronghold, Palpatine hoped to prove that this new empire could not be denied like its weaker predecessor. Tarkin rounded up thousands of civilians on charges of treason, and executed them without any court process. Knowing that in these massive sweeps, they were killing countless Clone Wars heroes that were loyal assets to the Republic. This is one of the first times the media and public started to question the Emperor, as news did make its way back to Coruscant. But the media eventually got hold of the story, and for a while, the Antar atrocity had become a celebrated cause in the core. The disappearances so fueled the public's hunger for details that the Emperor decided to remove Tarkin from the controversy by assigning him to pacification operations in the western reaches and had ultimately installed him as commander of the bases servicing the Deep Space Mobile Battle Station project. During this time, Tarkin would put down countless local rebellions and minor separatist holdouts, and it cemented in his mind the idea that these vermin could only be ruled through fear, that the Death Star was crucial to the peace of the Empire, as you could use the obedient masses to expose the rebel minority, knowing that being seen as a rebel outpost wouldn't just result in a battle that you could flee from one day and return another, it could mean that your entire planet would be destroyed, completely and forever, wiped from the galaxy. The western reaches were also home to countless asteroids, moons, barren worlds, and some populated ones that were full of untapped resources. And Krennic couldn't stand the fact that by pure luck, Tarkin was now managing this area of space. The rings over Geonosis were proving to be tapped, specifically of Dunamite and Dolovite, and Krennic hoped that mining could continue under the radar in the western reaches. Some of the most minerally rich planets happened to be labeled Legacy Worlds, an annoying holdover from the ineffective Republic era that protected worlds seen as worth preserving due to their cultural importance or natural beauty. They both agreed that to get around this, they could use Imperial secret project funds to finance recently exed separatist companies and do the illegal mining under their name. By the time anyone caught wind of this and put a stop to it, estimates said that they would have strip mined these worlds down to the bedrock gaining all the materials needed to secure peace. They carried this plan out, and Tarkin was glad to see that he was correct in avoiding taking up full hands-on leadership of this project until it was further along. These constant delays and issues from scientists to minerals made him concerned that this project may never be finished. Better leave Krennic in place to take the blame. But incendiary Krennic was perfectly suited to be the one held accountable for all the setbacks and delays that were bound to plague the project. The Emperor was also eyeing him to assume command and control of the battle station. To avoid having to accept the privilege prematurely, he would have to continue to defer to Krennic until the proper time. Again, his interests would line themselves up neatly in the actions of a smuggler named Haz Obit. Krennic had used him to rescue the Ursos, and now was in a joint plan with Tarkin to smuggle arms to mining operations, in effect framing them to look like rebel allies, which would then cue an Imperial investigation and lead to takeover. But as Obit saw these mining worlds completely devastated, he started to develop genuine rebel sympathies. In the salient system, he was able to warn Saw Gerrera's partisans about the next Imperial takeover, and would slightly embarrass Tarkin and expose their planting of evidence. When Tarkin's fleet claimed that they had intel that they were harboring rebels and weaponry, the mining representative denied this and insisted the imps search the entire facility, coming up with nothing. The rep had suspected this imperial tactic and gave strict instructions to deny all company ships from ever landing on the moon. Tarkin was forced to turn heel and leave, but noticed that Krennic's smuggler was going deeper into the star system, toward the planet Salient 2. Now this was all in the corporate sector, one of the only regions of the galaxy that was able to retain its autonomy from the Republic, CIS, and now Empire. When the massive Imperial Star Destroyer was picked up, they rushed out and demanded Tarkin to stand down, and that they would eliminate the smuggler ships. Tarkin was concerned that the corporate sector was secretly backing rebel forces, as Saw Gerrera was able to use Obit's intel to secure a few victories. He theorized that Krennic knew Obit's allegiance was faltering, and that by sending him to frame systems in the corporate sector, Krennic hoped to bait Tarkin into a battle that he would lose, embarrassing his rival, while also showing that the Imperial Star Destroyer was not enough, that the Death Star was the Empire's only hope. To test this, Tarkin called for support from a pair of destroyers over Telos, and conducted a micro-jump to pop out of hyperspace just out of range of the planetary defense forces of Salient 2. His suspicions were correct, and he hailed their defense fleet to demand that they give up the rebels. We know that the insurgents have made planetfall. 
Are you now prepared to surrender them to our custody? We decline to do so, Moff Tarkin, as they will be crucial to exposing the Empire's subterfuge. This was a problem as the Imperial framing tactic could be exposed, and still suspicious, Tarkin had the Ambassador's shuttle scanned. No signs of life were detected, and he shouted an order to lock that ship in place with the ISD's powerful tractor beam. The next beat would see three corporate sector warships emerge from behind Salient 2, and open fire on the Executrix. Tarkin made sure his command ship was outside of the range of the powerful planet-side turbolaser batteries, and the Ambassador's shuttle exploded in a massive fireball that proved it was a drone bomb ship. Tarkin now found himself in the most intense fighting he had seen since the Clone Wars. Though through all the chaos, he was forming a smirk at the thought of just how brazen young Krennic was. Taken off his guard, Tarkin was willing to admit to himself that he had underestimated Orson Krennic who was certainly the chief architect of the mess in which Tarkin found himself. This initial fight would last for hours, both forces tactically retreating and reorganizing. Imperial aid came in the form of two Venators and a swarm of ARC-170s, which after weeks of fighting, eventually gave them that original moon they were hoping to take, and then carried out the destruction of most of Salient 2's fleet. With the planetary shield projector disabled, their government sued for peace, and the ARC-170s would act in a blockade role, while surveys showed that anything of value, including the mining operations on the moon and planet, were both sabotaged. Militias were dug in planet-wide, and Tarkin knew that it would take months to clear them out, and more than six months to take Salient 1 with the forces that he currently had. To further embarrass him, when Tarkin hailed Mas Amida to update him on the progress and request more forces, the Shagrian kept noting that the transmission was cutting out and unstable, to which he finally had to admit that the salient forces were jamming him. And when the Vizier denied his request for troops or TIE fighters, Tarkin is frustrated and direct. If I didn't know better, Vizier, I might almost think that you're attempting to undermine my efforts. My grandstanding, as you call it, is part of the cost of moving the battle station project toward completion. This was not just a military embarrassment, but a PR issue exploited by the anti-imperial members of the Senate. And Amita used this delay as a way to jab at Tarkin's concept of the Moths, saying, You have advocated that the Moths be entrusted with sector control. Amita was saying, when it appears that you are incapable of subduing a single star system without Coruscant's help. Tarkin was furious at this situation Krennic had drawn him into, but knew the only way out was to fight for an eventual victory. For Salient One, he ordered a blitzkrieg rush of all of his forces that would take the world before they could sabotage their facilities. And this worked to rush a near immediate surrender, followed up by their forces finding Haas Obit's hideout. A Venator would collapse the cave system they were using, but scanner droids identified a single survivor, proving why the smuggler's moniker with the Partisans was Lucky Has. With a back to treatment, he awoke on the med bay of the Executrix, and Tarkin explained his options were to be tortured to death in Imperial prison, or flip on Krennic and help to undermine him. To Abbott, this was a win-win. He said that he was the one that rescued the Ursos, and it was Lyra Urso that convinced him that the Empire was doing horrible things to these worlds. And he believed that her husband Galen Urso wanted to flee the Empire as well. Obit wanted to save his friends and hamstring the Death Star project, while Tarkin would be able to get his revenge, turning his major defeat into something that could be used to separate Krennic from the project. Tarkin warned Krennic of Abbott's escape and said that he was tracked to Coruscant, and though Krennic worried that it may be to smuggle out the Ursos, when Obit showed up, there was no one with him, the smuggler claiming that he just hoped to hide out in the lower levels. All the while, Obit had set up Saw Gerrera to coordinate the Ursos' extraction, so Obit was with Krennic when this happened, and thus seemingly blameless, and vowed to cause disruptions in the Death Star project, providing all the intel to Tarkin in exchange for him keeping his identity as the smuggler rebel a secret. With this single action, the Emperor's wrath was now focused on Krennic, him stammering to explain how the project could continue with the loss of its lead scientist. The weapon and energy system production came to a halt, but building out the rest of the facility could continue. Palpatine wanted Tarkin to put an end to the pursuits of separatists and smugglers in the western reaches, and to make Sentinel Base his new home, personally overseeing the Death Star progress from a network of supply stations and moons over Geonosis. And within the military, rumors were split over Tarkin's new assignment, 
some thinking that a classified project must be located in the otherwise dull and quiet Geonosian system, or that this was indeed punishment from the Emperor. Though the Sentinel base was his home, he did have to travel out to oversee the countless mining operations that other Imperials were capturing with their own campaigns. Now focusing on the material Quadanium, the especially durable steel variant used to make up the large rectangular plates on the Death Star, but also in everything from Star Destroyers to TIE Fighters. One of these mining worlds was Agaris, and more delays were resulting from mysterious disappearances of Imperial droids. Most of wild space exploration was made possible by the cartography work of the now traitorous Auric and Risa Graf, whose children were believed to have joined a rebel cell on Lothal. This was the first Tarkin would ever hear of the backwater planet Lothal. And the problem was that the Graf family droid contained useful data on this region. Tarkin was working with a KX series security droid known by the designation K4D8, who many believed was secretly spying for Krennic, but nonetheless Tarkin used it to help with the monitoring of the shipments while he tried to locate the Graf children, and simultaneously try to extract intel from the imprisoned parents by claiming that he had their children in Imperial custody. Reports said that there was a crash landing on the fungus moon of Agaris, and he suspected that this was the rebel runs attempting a prison break. Tarkin's tactics with the parents were to remain kind to them, even offering a rare white Alderanian wine, but when he hinted that this world was devoid of sentient life, to be stripped to bedrock, he noticed the husband was trying to hide some sort of fear, as if there was some unreported life form here that could be lost. K4 was sent to investigate the crash site, and did find the family droid with the hidden data, returning to Tarkin with its severed head. Upon review, he learned that the Graphs were trying to cover up the existence of a sentient fungus species, which they knew had no hope of defeating the Empire, only hiding off the official maps. He summoned the prisoners and explained that he found their secrets, and if these natives could not be worked as slaves, they would be made extinct. And he said that their children were about to be executed as well. He then left them alone, and the pair were able to make an escape, meeting up with the children who had snuck into the facility. As they ran towards an exit, stormtroopers surrounded them, and Tarkin calmly walked out to explain that he knew this would draw the children out. With all of them in custody, he hoped to torture them and reveal the identities of rebel leaders on Lothal. The first round of torture would be to watch their sentient fungal friends be burned alive. All were outfitted with gas masks to protect them from the poisonous emissions, and a row of flame troopers walked towards a large collection of natives. Tarkin also prepared Thai bombers which were screaming in overhead. But just as he was about to conclude his victory speech, organic weaponry in the form of spiked spores rocketed out of the jungles and took down the lead bomber. The fiery wreck consumed the courtyard, and through the smoke came smaller spore weaponry and the native agrarian warriors storming the Imperial facility. Troopers were downed, and Tarkin rushed the prisoners off to his personal stealth corvette, the Carrion Spike. The natives intercepted him and explained that the troopers were not dead, just asleep, and would be healed if the Imperials would promise to leave them alone. Tarkin refused, and though he lost control of the prisoners, he would escape on the corvette, leaving K4 to fight to the death among the fungus. And from the viewport, he watched several organic ships take off from the world, a desperate attempt to evacuate their population in fear of the inevitable orbital bombardment. This was then followed by rebel ships that rescued the Grafs. All of this would see the end to the year 17 BBY, and from then to 14 BBY, Tarkin was being driven slightly insane by the drudgery of this massive construction project. He found himself sitting with an RA-7 protocol droid redesigning the Imperial officer's uniform, which at this point was still the same as the older public one. Tarkin wanted to keep it simple and comfortable, but the droid reminded him that a moth needed to stand out and remind those of his status. As they were working on this design, they were interrupted by some much-needed conflict. Rampart Station was under attack from a cruiser that had presented correct codes, but was now releasing separatist droid fighters. Sir, we have got multiple marks launching from the carrier. They're droid fighters. Tri-fighters, vultures, the whole Sep menagerie. But Tarkin noticed something peculiar in this hollow transmission. The most subtle of issues, but to a man whose life had depended on the analysis of these transmissions for several decades, he saw something that seemed fabricated about these hollows. When he ordered a ship to instantly jump to the spot of the supposed attack, the ship did not show up. Then it made micro jumps around the spread out complex of stations around Geonosis, and eventually it was picked up. Tarkin had found the true location of the attack, far from Rampart. When the Imperial ship engaged the carrier, it released even more droid fighters and was able to escape through hyperspace. This carrier was a smaller version of the Providence-class Dreadnought, 
specifically built from parts of the Lucid Voice, the sister ship of Grievous's flagship the Invisible Hand, while other parts came from the Invincible. Tarkin didn't bother to mask his surprise. That was Separatist Admiral Trench's ship, destroyed during the Battle of Christosis. The ship was modular in design, and the modules that survived must have been worth salvaging and putting on the open market. His advisors showed him records of how the Free Deck volunteers working at the Bilbringi shipyards had been dismantling these Clone Wars era ships. But there was evidence that credits were making some of these things disappear from the scrapyard and alter records. These Providence class ships had been one of, if not the best, hyperwave transmitting and encrypting technology. Developed out of the mercantile origins of the Separatists, evading pirate attacks and staying coordinated across the galaxy. Somehow, these attackers had used this tech to hijack and even produce false hollow transmissions. But even stranger to Tarkin was the lack of destruction they saw. The mysterious cruiser hadn't discharged any of its point defense or ranged weapons. Why hadn't whoever was behind the attack used the ship as a bomb by reverting from hyperspace in closer proximity to the moon? Planetary bodies larger than Sentinel had been shaken to their core by such events. While Tarkin was reviewing all the data being collected by his officers, he was interrupted by a call from Mas Amida, who again was probing and insinuating at the difficulties the Moss was having with keeping order. He thought of how Grand Uncle Jova would have loved to have had a Shagrian head mounted in his cabin, and after some verbal jousting, Amida finally reveals that it was the Emperor requesting that he speak with him personally on Coruscant. Tarkin ended the call and rushed to RA-7, telling him to get the new uniform crafted immediately. Tarkin summoned the uniformed 3D image of himself from the hollow table and regarded it, thinking back to Iriadu and recalling Jova's comment once more. It'll look even better with blood on it. The trip would be via the carrion spike, and he conducted a flash inspection of his crew, finding a stain on a boot that, through a series of questions and observations, resulted in him revealing that one of his crew was a spice user, and that there may even be a group of users on board. Even the officers that worked closely with him every day were shocked at how he was able to reveal all of this from a simple stain on a boot, a stain that corresponded with a type of oil only found on a specific speeder held in a part of a ship where he had previously found a discarded spice baggie. Tarkin wanted to be sure that when on Coruscant, his crew would see him like some sort of mind-reading omniscient god with eyes everywhere that could not be outsmarted, especially while arriving on the custom stealth ship made personally for him. A ship that was perhaps only surpassed by some unknown vessel used by Darth Vader or the Emperor. When he arrived on the capital, he had to dodge the prying questions of those like Nils Tenet, Republic Rear Admiral turned Joint Chief, and when they were brought down into the lower levels of the Jedi Temple, now the Imperial Palace, he saw Vader warning a group of crime bosses to flee Coruscant and go to the Outer Rim, ending his speech by using the Force to explode the heart of a Twi'lek Prefect who managed one of the lower levels. Tarkin smiled as Amida was stricken with fear and excused himself. He was now alone with Vader, and mused how this towering, ominous cyborg was the Emperor's first terror weapon. And the more they talked and Tarkin studied his movements, he thought that the rumors that this was some secret alien Sith, a lab abomination, or Palpatine's version of General Grievous was wrong. He was more certain that he knew the face behind this black mask. Vader might very well be Jedi Knight Anakin Skywalker, whom Tarkin had fought beside during the Clone Wars, and for whom he had developed a grudging appreciation. Vader explained that the droid Gotra, a rebel group comprised solely of droids of all sorts and variety, had been behind a lot of attacks on Coruscant, but he had to cut this conversation short and meet with the Emperor. The new office had some art like the old relief panel of an ancient battle and statue of Sistros, along with new items acquired as spoils of war, and Palpatine thought back on their long friendship. Twenty years ago, who would have thought that two men from the Outer Rim would sit at the center of the galaxy? As they talked about the unruly sectors of the galaxy, Tarkin again pitched his idea that Moff should be assigned to regions of the galaxy, much like the sector army idea of the Clone Wars, but now to manage the resources, rebel uprising, and maintain overall order in their section. Essentially, local dictators that would all refer back to and defer to the Emperor. Palpatine was thinking something similar, and agreed to implement a system like this in due time. 
For now, he wanted them to meet with the ruling council, a mysterious circle of figures with influence even greater than his. Yet these odd fellows like Ars Dangor, Sate Pestage, and Janus Grigatis stood out as ridiculous in their colorful costumes, flanked by grizzled ISB leadership and naval intelligence officers like Vularan. And he was surprised to feel an alien emotion. Tarkin felt awkward and out of place, so he moved towards Darth Vader and Amida. When the meeting opened up, the ISB reported finding a massive stockpile of Separatist equipment similar to that used by the Shadowfeed network, which was able to slice into the holonet and spread propaganda during the Clone Wars, the operation that Tarkin had destroyed with a campaign so violent many considered it a war crime. Tarkin wasn't sure who else in the room knew about the attacks in Geonosian space using faked hollows, and he had to hint at the issue, eventually needing to reveal details like the repurposing of Separatist droids, and the fact that most likely it was an Imperial intelligence expert that was helping these rebels. Ignoring the ISB agent's outrage at the implication, and after further bickering that reminded Tarkin of the Republic era, Masamita stomped down his staff and called for the meeting to end. The ultimate fate of what to do with the stockpile on the planet Mercana would be decided by the Emperor. In the Emperor's chamber, Palpatine explained that there is a supernatural importance to this planet, that the ties to Vader and Tarkin's past here were not a coincidence. Do you not find it intriguing that both you and Moff Tarkin have ties to the very planet where this newly discovered cache of jamming devices has been found, Tarkin, to quash Dooku's shadow feeds, and you, in one of your first missions, I seem to recall, to effect an execution. And that, my apprentice, is why Mokana matters to us. Because the dark side of the Force has, for whatever reason, brought that world to our attention once more. When Vader asked who would command this mission, he saw something that Tarkin would also detect. That this was some sort of trial for these two. A sudden glint in his eye, Sidious shrugged. I thought I would allow you and Moff Tarkin to work that out. The Emperor goes further to try and make Vader understand that Tarkin was one of them. Not just in mentality, but in the fact that the Force took preference of him, but also tested him in ways that Vader was not appreciating. Has it never struck you that all three of us, you and Tarkin and I, the Empire's architects, if you will, hail from worlds that occupy but a narrow slice of galactic space? Naboo, Tatooine, Iriadu, all within an arc of less than 30 degrees. You are under the misimpression that only Sith and Jedi have trials to pass. Ending the conversation by warning him that Marcana was indeed a trap, but they need to walk into it to uncover who is behind it, and that to learn more of Tarkin, Vader should ask him why his ship is named the Carrion Spike. He may grow to respect the military man more. With this, Vader took a dozen stormtroopers and met with Tarkin, who had sent the rest of his crew, except for the captain and comms officer, back to the Sentinel base moon. As they entered the ship, he noted that though this was his corvette, and he was a moth, it was impossible to not be somewhat frightened by the knowledge of the Dark One's title of Sith Lord, his invisible weapon of the Force, and his blood-red lightsaber. He knew this was a test, and fear turned into odd fascination as he watched Vader nervously or angrily pacing, supervising the loading of a large black sphere into the cargo bay of the Carrion Spike. When it bumped into a wall, Vader nearly killed an old Clone Wars vet, Sergeant Crest, an original batch clone trooper that commanded the stormtroopers. Tarkin could not figure out what purpose this thing served, hypothesizing everything from a cyborg toilet to healing chamber to simply a place where Vader could strip off his mechanical suit. Whatever it was, he was not asked or informed about this being placed in his personal ship, not even when Vader ordered the men to link it to the ship's power system. The mission that follows would bring the Sith and Moff closer than before, as they hunt down the greatest threat to the Empire to date, a threat that would prove to be just one part of a larger movement of rebellion that Tarkin would spend the rest of his days suppressing, bringing him into contact with other military geniuses like the alien Thrawn, and bring the conflict with Krennic to a head, as he hoped the Death Star would be the embodiment of the Tarkin family philosophy, wielding fear as a weapon to ensure order. Thanks for watching guys, keep an eye out for part 3. If you made it this far, the best way to help me out is to hit that like button, share it with somebody who will like it, and subscribe if you want to see more. You can go even further by checking out the links in the description. We will find affiliate links with discounts to cool metal print art and free audiobooks from Audible. You'll also find our Patreon and PayPal, and special shout out to our supporters over on Patreon, especially our $25 tier supporters, Matthew Beltrami, Bill Payne, 
Brandon Robinson and Jace Peck. But most important of all, remember, the best way to make Tarkin smile is to use a clever plot to try and kill him. And the Force will be with you, always.